<laughs> okay, we're live. And there's a cat on the screen. Um, <laughs> welcome, everybody. <laughs> so, welcome to building your data st strategy from scratch. Um, I'm here with panelists from Intricity. My name is Serge, I'm from SQL DBM. And in this webinar, we're going to cover, as promised, beginning to end, starting assuming you have no data strategy, maybe you don't even have data. How do you plan on taking your enterprise, your data strategy to enterprise scale? So we're going to be sharing tips, strategies, and solutions to go through that. So just to give a little bit of background to myself and the other presenters, my name is Serge Gershkovich. I am a development advocate at SQL DBM. I'm also a data warehouse architect, so working primarily with Snowflake and, and other, other BI technologies. And let me hand it over to Jared to yep. introduce himself and the rest of the team. Yeah, I'm Jared Hillam, I'm the VP of Emerging Technologies here at Intricity. Um, and Rich, you want to go next? Yeah, Senior Director of uh, uh, Data Architecture at Intricity and with 30 plus years in the, in the data space. So seen, Katie? done this a few times. Yeah. I'm much younger than Rich. I've only been doing it for 20 <laughs> 28 years. Uh, Arcady Kleiner, I'm the practice director here at Intricity. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, Arcady's calling from an island somewhere, and that's not a that's not a joke. He's uh, dialing in from vacation to do this, but I, I hope I, I really wanted him to come on because if you ever check Arcady's LinkedIn profile, the number of companies that he's actually done this exactly what we're going to talk about. Um, uh, is pretty astounding. He's done a lot of this kind of strategy work. So I've asked him to come on um, and he's been gracious enough to give us some of his vacation time to step us through, um, you know, building a data strategy from scratch. So Arcadia, let me give it to you. Um, I'll, I'll operate slides and, uh, and give us, give us the, uh, the sweet nectar of knowledge. <laughs> with pleasure uh and again thanks for everyone for for joining so jared you can move on to to the next slide okay we're there um i think one of the big things that you uh, often we often hear from customers is when do i need to do a data strategy is am i at a point where you know in the organization this is necessary and so we took real quotes from some of our real customers uh, where the idea of no single version of the truth, it, it rules the day. Lots of single points of failure. Uh, folks that have no integration between systems. Excel is the place where business logic lives. And many of you, especially if you're on the business side, recognize that these are typical challenges for many enterprises, whether large or, or small. And, and, and Arcadia, so, if I remember correctly, this was actually from meeting minutes uh, with, with a company, right? So these are, these are that's right. an actual. That's yeah. right. I, I've cleaned them up a little bit so that right, people's right, right. names are, are removed and, and other things. But, you know, there's nothing obviously proprietary here. But, right. you know, it's very common where people are overwhelmed with one-off data projects. Because if you if you operate in any any organization, the, the biggest challenge is you've got data everywhere, and you know the old adage, data rich, information poor. And so I wanted to share real quotes from real meetings from real people, not just a you know a bunch of PowerPoint slides. And so if you look at this, the bubbles there, dispersed Excel spreadsheets. When you've got spreadsheets that have people's names attached to them. You know, Jared's spreadsheet, Mary's spreadsheet, you know that this is a time to engage and focus on a data strategy because when Excel rules the day, there's nothing wrong with Excel, but when Excel rules the day, it becomes really, really difficult. If you can move on to the next one. You bet. We put this together to give you a sense of where and what you'd like to move to, where, what data strategy gets you. And the first step is to figure out where are you now? Are you on the far left? Are you on the far right? And so we'll talk a little bit about this concept of a center of excellence. So 
strategy engagements with many organizations yield a document, yield a PowerPoint. And we believe that that is precisely why strategy engagements fail, because it's not about a PowerPoint. It's about a change to process. It's about some sort of a transformation, whether it be, you know, people are calling things digital transformations, but it's all about ultimately data is their information more precisely is there to support a business process. And so our goal is to go beyond just a PowerPoint. You want a change in culture. You want a change in behavior. And so Center of Excellence is a mechanism that we've used successfully to help organizations begin small and then grow and blossom uh, repeatable practices as part of their business. And so if you look at the lower left-hand corner, you've got lots of random projects. You've got lots of folks doing random things to support uh, business requirements. Knowledge is locked away in spreadsheets or lives in somebody's uh, um, you know, access database uh, on their desktop. So we call that evolution as uncontrolled data behaviors. There isn't a center of excellence. There isn't a data strategy to move things forward. And then of course, as you proclaim data standards, you eventually get to a point where you can enforce those standards. And so as you move to the far right in, into the upper right-hand corner, you've got expanded and enhanced formal center of excellence that's in place and shared knowledge. Projects are prioritized based on data needs and alignment with other groups. So data assets are not produced for, for consumption in just one application. Yeah, and, and, and when I think about this, it's really taking an organization that is already investing in, in conforming data. They just don't know it. It's happening at the individual level, and they're investing and reinvesting and reinvesting and reinvesting every single time someone opens up these Excel spreadsheets and tries to conform knowledge. Um, exactly. And, and then, and it's not conformed really to an organizational perspective of the data, but rather just an individual perspective. So anytime somebody has to ask a question that is strategic in nature, that crosses the boundaries of, you know, the Excel spreadsheet, there's no way to do it. Just like personal growth, uh, corporate and enterprise growth is no different. We mm -hmm. rise to the level of our ambitions and we fall to the level of our systems. Yep. I like the, the fall to the level of our systems. That's good. <laughs> yep. It's a true. Good, good description. Again, like when you're trying to make change that the people that resist the change, they just fall to the level of whatever knee jerk reaction they, they have or their systems. Yeah. We, we talk about the Parkinson's law in, in projects. It's a, it's a similar concept. And again, as practitioners, the things that we want to be able to see is change is improvement. We, when we start a project, to where we end the project, we know that we've moved the organization forward. And certainly, as Jared said, lots of experience. I'll talk about three organizations and sort of their journey um, a little bit later on, but we'll, we, we see uh, a change that can happen. And, and the biggest advice for organizations in embarking on a data strategy is make sure you're, you, you start small and also engage somebody that does the work not just the strategy, mm -hmm. engage somebody that understands data modeling, engage somebody that understands um, what we do with life cycle management, what do we do with code promotion, all of those kinds of things are important to have a successful data strategy. That's why a PowerPoint should not be the result of a data strategy, it should be <laughs> something that leads to actual, actual data. And we've seen some doozies, like we'll walk into an organization, and they'll have you know, literally hundreds of slides, but no actual deliverables, like nothing that actually moved the ball any further forward, you know, uh, well, to, to getting there. Arcady, you may remember a project we did a couple of years ago, not too far from where you live. And uh, they just insisted, we need a PowerPoint. We need a PowerPoint. And we kept saying, no, we don't want the PowerPoint. And we finally kind of gave in and gave them a PowerPoint. And they came back and said, this has only got four slides in it. We need like a hundred. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it went back and forth. There were not enough slides. 
Yeah, and, and I think there's a balance. I, I think you have to be able to clearly, you know, if you looked at the very first slide or if you look at the logo in the upper left-hand corner, simplifying complexity is not easy. It's, it's really hard. But yeah. by simplifying complexity, especially when it comes to data, you're able to take reasonable, actionable steps that organizations can, can feel are making a difference. And, and again, PowerPoints are wonderful because you can convey ideas, you can do lots of things on a, on a PowerPoint slideshow. Um, you, know, you, you could lay out the organization. That's another big part of data strategy. What should my organization look like? But we'll get to that. Yeah, let me move to the next slide and you can speak to that. I, I always, you know, we always talk about people, process and technology. And I think that's, a, that's absolutely true. Those are important uh, components of it. But culture trumps the other three every single time. So when you embark on a data strategy, and as I said before, data strategy leads to a center of excellence because you want to promote your strategy to other departments. You want to promote strategy to other parts of your organization. And so if you think about this and you, you go around this wheel and you could pick, you know, do I have good data governance and, and good data availability? Do I have good uh, promotion and showcasing of capabilities? That step at the bottom that's right around the culture side is so critical. We've seen it, we've seen it done really well. There's an executive that was uh, that Jared and I interviewed recently, who's done that exceptionally well, taking and promoting and showcasing uh, your lessons learned, sharing it with others is incredibly important as part of promotion process. Yeah, if you want to investing end up watching, in education. Yeah, go ahead. Please, I was just going to say, if you want to watch that video, it's 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 with uh, her name is Rhonda, and she um, she works for Bell Helicopters, and and the amazing part was is that. Uh, it was all, ex she would externalize the credit of everything, you know, externalize it to the people that are, that are putting the time into the, the effort, uh, uh, you know, really showcase people that were, uh, that were participating in the, um, uh, in the program of, of executing their centralized warehouse, as well as their uh, data lake, as well as you know, just the, the sharing of logic uh, really made a big difference when, when you promote the people that are, that are bringing it to the table. Just two other quick points on this, you know, best practice knowledge repository, where do we keep our knowledge? How do we share that knowledge is, is really important. Uh, I touched very quickly on training and education. We believe that's an important part of your data strategy. And uh, people always talk about tools, what technology choices we make. And so as we move to the next slide, Jared, I wanna make sure that folks on, on this webinar understand that it's not about the technology or it's not just about the technology. Practices are so important, but people get mired in data lakes. Should I build a data lake? Should I do MDM? Should I do a CDP? Do I need a data catalog? All of those things are part and parcel of what a good data strategy includes, but technology is, 10% of the equation, it, you know, my analogies, I, I, I use food analogies all the time, um, or <laughs> architectural analogies, or water analogies, and really, if we use a water analogy, for example, you know, water is important, but the way it gets transported is important, the way it gets delivered is important, you know, all of those things that are part of that process, um, I, I remember a, um, an executive, a, a chief executive of a, of a Fortune 500 company, uh, giving me 30 seconds to say, well, what, do you, what does Intricity do? What's your value proposition? And, and I, I thought about it for a minute and I said, we're like the Army Corps of Engineers. We bring, we bridge, we build a bridge between business and IT. We bring water to the villagers. And a successful data strategy, uh, certainly if you start from scratch or you start from wherever your organization happens to be on its maturity journey, has to address more than just technology, more than just tools and uh, buzzwords. So I, I see data lake on that slide, and um, it seems like if you're not doing data mesh these days, you're not you're not cool. So where is this yeah, slide yeah. from 2010, <laughs> or what's going on? Yeah, we need to get data mesh on here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. And, and, 
and, and that's the thing. I think you touch on something that's really important. You know, when we used to fly, we'd look at the Moving back target. of the airline magazine and it would tell us, you know, what we should be investing in. We as executives, we'd see <laughs> Salesforce or we'd see, uh, yeah. you know, Snowflake or we'd see some other things. We don't fly as much anymore. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll start doing that soon. But the, but the buzz uh, is, is still there. And so the buzz is important because it moves things. It, it, it creates conversation with people. Uh, data governance is still very much a, on, on top of mind. And data strategy includes all of those things. It includes yeah. data governance. It includes you know, conversation around data science and data catalogs and data maturity. So all that, all that alphabet soup that you see in the middle of the slide is certainly uh, important, but it needs to be aligned with what your data strategy is. And Serge, when we when we add data mesh, we'll cross off ETL and put ELT on there too. So yeah, yeah. Don't worry, we we got <laughs> that under control. <laughs> Um, the other part, and, and this is from my TOGAF days and a lot of the work that uh, we did with, with Rolls-Royce as an example, enterprise architecture is not something that should be disconnected from your uh, data strategy. Data strategy and enterprise architecture are very, very much aligned. And this is an example, obviously, of what we call a logical solution architecture. We typically produce these as part of our data strategy engagement that are not you know a picture but specific to your organization but what do i do with real-time data what do i do with my enterprise data with systems like sap or salesforce or oracle what what's that process look like we look at data consumption i've got consumers i might be doing data science with python or r uh, tableau business objects looker microstrategy cognos business objects you know, all of those are wonderful tools again, but how do they make, how do we make that data available to them? How do we transform that data? What do we do with modeling? Where do we do modeling? Um, how do we store the assets in our models? How do we forward engineer uh, those models? The, the next big thing is how do we build a reproducible data ingestion pipeline? How do we deal with changes in data, whether they be real-time streaming or end of day or intraday micro batches, how do we build it in such a way that it becomes a factory, um, an intricity data factory as we call it, irrespective of what your cloud environment is. If you're on AWS or Azure or GCP, great. Uh, the, the, the issue is not the cloud that you're on, the issue is the practices. The other big thing that's here is how do we modernize our orchestration? How do we deal with data ops, DevOps, which are again, a big part of what we would normally do as part of a data strategy. Yeah, you, you know, I, I had a, um, a friend of mine that was, we, we were just having a friendly conversation. He's like, well, what is it that you guys actually do? And, you know, I was trying to explain that is always difficult. And I said, you know, you know, in a lot of ways, we're the industrial engineers of data. Um, you know, turn, when you build a factory to build something, you have to have an industrial engineer to plan it out and to, and to execute on, on its, ex, you know, uh, actually making the factory work. And, um, and this pre-planning phase is really, you know, creating that blueprint of the factory that turns data into information for your organization and does it, does it regularly every single day. Uh, and w without, you know, without, uh, you know, copious intervention, um, but, but a lot of, uh, automation. So you're seeing the blueprint right in front of you. <clears throat> exactly. And Jared, as we move to the next slide, I touched on this briefly, but what's our data management life cycle? How do we take mm -hmm. code and how do we move it through what we do in development, which is a, a, a normal CI CD pipeline. And this shows sort of GitHub in the middle, but irrespective of the tooling, What's our process for leveraging the code assets, leveraging the data model, leveraging the DDL that, that's there? How do we manage that life cycle? And if we make changes, how do we enforce those changes to flow through a standard process? So that when we look at what's been published, it, it matches to what we have us in, in our enterprise data 
uh, repository. So this is also an important part. It's often very new to organizations because they're not used to treating their data in this form. Well, yeah, and another part that's really new to organizations is how do you do in doing this in an automated fashion and removing the complexity from this. And, you know, there's, there's been attempts at this many, many times um, and, and a lot of failures because it, mm -hmm. because it just becomes so complex. And so it's, you know, how do we, how do we take this? How do we remove the complexity? How do we automate a lot of this? So it, uh, as Arcady said, you know, it's just, it's part of the process. And, um, mm -hmm. and also because we're seeing uh, right on this diagram, unit testing and integration testing and code review, these are not things that a lot of people naturally start doing. So just that step from zero to one, from just using a code repository is, is huge to mm -hmm. getting, getting yourself set up for success for future evolution of your life cycle, your data management suite. So don't expect to have this process automated overnight, just as soon as you start working, you take the natural progression. Mm -hmm. yeah, completely agree. And again, it needs to be considered as part of your data strategy. Uh, not that you'll get there overnight, but you need to have, what are the steps? How do I begin? Where do I go? Uh, because again, this is Nobody does this well from, from day one. You don't learn this, unfortunately, as part of your computer science degree or your information management degree. These things are not covered. And so this is practice-based, and that's where it has to, it has to go beyond a pretty slide. Yeah. And, and to that point, too, and along with a lot of this that we're talking about, uh, right, Arcadia, is that you begin with the end in mind, right? We're not going to get to the end right away, but we need to understand what that end is. Because uh, I love that saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? And, <laughs> and um, you know, so, you know, we need to understand what, what the, the picture really looks like of where we want to be mm -hmm. so that we can, we know those steps to take to be able to get us there. Yeah, completely agree. We touched on this, and I think this slide is really important. Um, data models are at the core at the, at the heart of the challenge that organizations ultimately need to focus on. We have many customers where the data model looks like that of the source. And frankly, part of your data strategy is understanding layers of curation that data needs to go through in order for it to become a usable asset. I used an example of water, but Jared's got a wonderful video on Intricity 101 uh, called Data as Plastic. If you think about raw data as a plastic pellets that arrive on your loading dock that ultimately will become a toy or will become some consumer good, they, those raw materials have to go through a curation process. You don't ship a pound of pellets to a customer that wants a toothbrush or wants a radio, or wants a toy. You expect, customers expect, that raw materials are for your factory process to run through, and they want the finished good. They want the product. Data is no different. Data should not be given to end users in its raw form for them to figure out how to manage it. Many times I've talked about a proverbial Excel spreadsheet where the first 99 sheets are you doing the data munging, figuring out how do I align this data? How do I conform it? How do I clean it? How do I enrich it? And then sheet 100 is where the actual decision-making can be done. And so you have systems in your organizations that represent best of breed. Let's say it's a CRM like Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics, or it might be you know, an ERP system like uh, um, SAP or any of Oracle EBS or anything else, NetSuite, those systems are there, they're what we call data silos, but they're important. They provide value to the, the accounting group. They provide value to uh, order management. They provide value to sales. They provide value to marketing. Lots of data is captured in many of these systems. We've got websites, we've got tracking, we've got all sorts of things that come into the organization, IoT devices. But the value of it is ultimately when you can answer a question based on something that provides you insight. And so this process-driven data modeling approach 
is a conversation about the processes that live in your business ultimately have places that you would like to measure. Think of it as Six Sigma, think of it as Lean or any of the other practices that we in the business world apply today. Ultimately, they're all about measuring. How do we measure? How do we get to a point where we know that we are doing better today than we did yesterday? And data modeling and process-driven data modeling is critically important to that success because you, you don't want businesses say that they want data, give me all the data. In reality, what they want is actionable information. And this data modeling approach completely changes the, the paradigm of enabling the business to be able to run the organization with information rather than data. Yeah, I agree. It, it, you, you have to, you have to have a, a place that, you know, gives the final product at some point. And otherwise you just, like you said, just giving them the plastic pellets and expecting them to, to, uh, you know, to make their toothbrush. <clears throat> we don't, we don't live. Sorry, sorry, interrupt. I was just going to say, because we don't live in Star Trek yet. Yeah, that it's just as important for the developers as it is for the final business users. Obviously, business users don't really need all these disparate conform dimensions. They just want to see one final denormalized table that they can easily query and, and filter. But even as a developer, as you, as you said, you're the one working in the factory. You're the one who's going to be assembling these pellets. So you need to be able to see exactly how the different pieces of your organization tie in together at a, at a physical level of what are the conform dimensions, how to do the joins, which, um, which data domains can be interfaced, and how do they mesh together. So I think we're going to cover that later. So I don't want to jump yeah. the gun. <laughs> All right. So organization, or Katie. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think this is, we started here and we're coming back to this. So if we think about uh, a lot of time we spend with business in figuring out how to make this idea of data strategy stick. And a lot of times it's about where in the organization should the center of excellence live? Should it report and be a department under the sea level? Should it be it's a shared service and we virtualize the COE? Should it be distributed? So we have a distributed COE within each of the divisions. Or should we make COE part of ops and, and other permutations of this? So a lot of times, and Jared knows this because he's seen the output of the strategy work that we do. A lot of times we're, we're aligning and we're putting names on the board of what should the organization look like. Uh, because one of the big success factors in a successful data strategy is having uh, good owners. And again, we don't do a data strategy that is, you know, one size fits all. It starts with the interviews of the business and then it switches to how do we move from there? Yeah. I mean, it, the, the owners, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, when you're, when you're rep Surplanting a existing, uh, you know, hand-built Excel mess. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who have really, you know, embraced their Excel spreadsheet and become become so connected to, uh, you know, perhaps a bad system that already exists. And so sometimes the, you know, the executive relationship with uh, the the center of excellence really becomes critical because it's it's requiring a change in the organization that uh, you know that we we want to avoid the situation like Serge said um, where people just go back to the the, the system that the, the old system that they had and so having this org in place is, is super critical to make sure that we have the level of sponsorship necessary to to drive the change needed. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, you are not alone, Arcady. Yes, <laughs> I know. I can actually see, see the slides. Too. Oh, you can. So, I didn't know if you could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. I can. Um, it, cell phone reception is great. Wi-Fi reception is not. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm, 
I go back and this is an event, you know, like all of us have, have these pivotal events in our, in our careers. This was an important pivotal event for me because rarely do we have an opportunity to spend a full day with three large organizations. And these three are obviously in very different parts of, um, you know, they're, they operate in different industries. Nestle uh, was very kind to host this event. Uh, we were all in Vivay, Switzerland. I was uh, working at the time to, uh, for the benefit of the CTO at, at Rolls-Royce and, and joined this uh, workshop. Um, and so it was Nike, Rolls-Royce and Nestle three organizations that were in very different parts of their data maturity. And the entire day was spent on talking about data strategy, talking about how to create a cohesive strategy across the business. And frankly, this was at a time when Nestle invested and put over a thousand people into their business to focus on re process re-engineering, to focus on implementing a data strategy. This was, you know, at a time where lots of acquisitions were going on. Rolls-Royce changed their business from a model where they would sell engines uh, to a model where they would charge for hours on wing. And so again, they saw growth from 11 billion to 22 billion at that time. And lots of exciting things were going on, but data, again, was a challenge. IoT data was a challenge. Uh, data that was coming out of their ERP systems, multiple ERP systems was a challenge. Uh, Nestle was grappling with multiple uh, siloed organizations as part of their acquisition strategy. And so they needed to, to have a data strategy because that was how they were going to roll these up and make decisions. And, and Nike uh, joked as part of the session, they said, you know, while our attitude is just do it, that does not apply to data <laughs> strategy. You can't just do it. You have to consider it. You have to plan it. And so what we've done successfully, and, and I wish we again can, can do this where, uh, you know, others uh, can join these conversations, but we hold these data strategy sessions within a single company. Um, certainly in this case, having the three was wonderful because they each were in different points of their maturity. If you saw that early slide about maturity, one organization was on the far left, one was in the middle, and one was on the far right. And so it, it was wonderful to share lessons learned and experiences. Uh, the, the location certainly was, was amazing, and, and, and Nestle did a wonderful job of, of hosting us. Um, but again, data strategy and the fact that it, it, your organization needs it, you are not, you're certainly not alone. And, and as you'll see on the, on the slides that come, there, there are many organizations where we've done this work before. Yeah. All right, strategy, strategy acceleration migration. <clears throat> um, I think all of us can talk to this. This is what Intricity yeah. does. We've broken it into three key areas. Um, I'll start it on the right and I'll move, move back to strategy. For many, the question is, what, what do I do as part of my data strategy to modernize? What is my modernization strategy? So I have Teradata, I have Netiza, I have SQL Server, I have Oracle, I have Oracle Exadata, I have Greenplum. And my question is, and, and I have other technologies, I might have Informatica, Teradata, uh, Netiza, sorry, Informatica Data Stage, Talent, the many <laughs> other, other systems. How do I modernize, modernize those things? And so part of this, and how do I move from ETL to ELT to, to Rich's example? And so a lot of the work that, that we do is help companies formulate a component of their data strategy that focuses on migrations. Big, big part, certainly now as folks are looking to uh, both modernize as well as save, save dollars. And so we touch modernization of databases, modernization of integration tools, uh, but also at the same time, how do we create new practices, not just move, but also improve? Yeah, the, the, the acceleration for us is, is, you know, how do we automate these, these things that take a long time to build 
you know, how can we automate them so they don't take such a long time? I mean, it, it, and we, we consider SQL DBM to be part of that automation so, so that we have, you know, we can make this a team effort uh, to, to build out, um, you know, the modeling and the, the revisioning of the, of the models. Um, you know, that automation is so fundamental to, ha- to being able to, uh, to, to make it a team effort. Um, whereas in the past, it used to be just sort of this thing that would happen in the corner um, when we would, we'd continuously have to go back and, you know, do these executive meetings to make sure that it was fitting expectation. But now they're basically part of that process organically. And we firmly believe that because of the ease with which anyone can use SQL DBM, all you need is a, is a browser. The idea is that multiple skill sets will collaborate. Yes, developers, certainly. Yes, architects, certainly. But it's also business users. We want business users to be involved in the process as well. A data model is not a pretty picture that hangs on, on somebody's, in somebody's cubicle. Right. A data model is really a representation of your business. This is translation of all the things that you passionately care about in a representation that lives inside of SQL DBM. Yeah, and 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 not only that, but it's it's uh, it's gets physicalized in a database, which is you know where the data is stored. So it's a it's a representation not only just of the business, but it's a physical representation of the business with data. So it's a it's a powerful concept. So, so Arcady, I, I can take on these last two slides before we pass it over to Serge. Um, and so the, this, these last uh, last two slides are just a little bit about us. Um, this is a an eye chart of just different companies we've done this at, um, these types of strategies. Um, and a, a vast majority of these have, have had some kind of, you know, data warehouse in the cloud, data lake in the cloud. Uh, the uh, uh, data mesh in the cloud, <laughs> you know, to, to put all the buzzwords in, right? Um, really uh, across the board data strategies that, that go from pulling the data all the way to, to presenting the data to, uh, to the end users. Um, and then the last but not least is uh, we, there's, a, there's a channel that we have. Um, it's a thought leadership channel on YouTube. Uh, that, that gets a lot of just explainer videos that are very simple. This is really useful for organizations that are trying to educate their user base. The reason we included this slide is, you know, often when you're in those early stages, you're trying to educate the organization, you need sort of a viral message. Um, so I would recommend taking a look at some of the videos that we have on Intricity 101 because they explain some of the most basic things like, you know, what is, uh, what is a data lake? What is a data warehouse? What is, um, what is a database schema? Um, what is a master data management? What is data governance? Uh, what is ELT versus ETL? Um, so just a, a whole host of videos that are no more than four minutes long and we, and they get used in uh, a little over 200 universities and there's a lot of subscribers and whatnot, but, um, but we want to uh, have that out there for folks that are starting from scratch and are having to uh, get the messaging out. And if you're a practitioner, um, take a look at these in, in, from the perspective of how could I improve my messaging so that it's a little easier for the CFO uh, or, uh, you know, CXO that is not necessarily a, a propeller head uh, to, to be able to consume this information. All right. So I'm going to pass to Serge and, and um, you know, and, and so that you can see the, the power of SQL DBM in, in encapsulating, you know, the, the, uh, the thoughts of the organization within a data model. Um, so let me just stop sharing um, Serge, and I'll pass it to you. There you go. Thanks, Jared. Let me just go ahead. Spin up screen, share. Okay, can you all see that? Mm-hmm. All right, so data modeling. What can we say about it? Um, I'm, I don't want to go through a feature demo of the tool itself. Um, I want to stay on topic and really focus on the keys to making a successful data strategy work through modeling, through collaboration, through um, 
meshing this into your CI CD pipeline. So if you do want to explore the tool, uh, head over to sqldbm.com, check it out. Uh, you can sign up for a demo for myself or any one of our solution architects, and we'd be happy to walk you through all of our extensive feature lists. But what I'd really like to talk about is, is actual modeling and its importance to your data strategy. So kind of what we touched on earlier, why is data modeling so important? What is it? What is data modeling? So right now I am looking at a data model of a of a fictitious data enterprise. And this is their schema. This is all of their uh, domains, business entities um, grouped together. And what can I tell from this document? So on many of our, of our calls, we get questions like, uh, because this is literally, we, we show people how to get started with this. It's, if I count the clicks, maybe you know three, four clicks away from from zero, starting a new project to having this and being able to show this to a business user, to your CIO, to your um, analyst and say, look, here are, here are the tables at a detailed level. Here are, let's say, I'm just speaking to a developer. I want to show them the primary key and foreign key relationships, just how is my master data related to my fact tables, Maybe I want to hide the attributes of uh, of the details and things like that for now. So we can literally do this just by connecting to Snowflake, pointing to a schema, and getting the DDL. And then all of these relationships are automatically drawn for me based on primary and foreign keys. And the first question I get asked is, well, what does that mean? Uh, we we don't define our primary foreign keys. We're a data warehouse, or we're we're Snowflake. Um, so Snowflake either doesn't support it or it doesn't enforce it. None of those, well, it doesn't enforce it, but it certainly supports it. And why should you take the time to do this? Because at the end of the day, it shouldn't be something you're doing after the fact. Um, your primary keys are something that you define when you build your bus matrix. So I'm sure Intricity has a four minute mm -hmm. video on the bus matrix. You can go and explore that, but it's before you even touch a database, you need to map out your business. You need to map out what are the dimensions of your different departments and even what are your different departments and what data do they own. Once you have that on paper or in PowerPoint, if that's your thing, then you can start, this is where modeling begins of putting those dimensions on paper, seeing them together, seeing where are the overlaps, which will give you those shared dimensions, which will basically de define your data marts and where all of these things come together for reporting. This is before anyone even tells you, you know, the specifics of what that report should look like. You already know what you can present to the business. So if we're looking at that on this diagram, we know, for example, or maybe let me jump to something a little bit simpler, the product diagram. We have a product dimension. We know that it has a product key. That means you know, one, one single um, identifier, uh, numeric identifier um, identifies a unique product and it's used in, as one of the dimensions in a sale. So I can't make a sale if I don't have a product attached to it, obviously. Um, but technically speaking, I want to know how these two are related. And my subcategory, is this a standalone table? Um, does it use product or does product use subcategory? So mm -hmm. we're looking in, um, in IDAFIX notation. So maybe crow's foot, if people are more familiar with that. It's a many to one in this in this regard. So, regardless of, of how you depict it, this is what we were saying earlier about abstractions. Um, the most important thing, and I think this is something our tool does really well, is sticking to the basics. Because what is the best way to represent data, to represent relationships? Luckily, there's a very familiar convention and it's called SQL. You can speak SQL to just about anybody and they're going to understand what you're saying. So mm -hmm. 
when we pull in a project, all we're doing is we're getting the DDL and that tells us the structure, the relationships. That means every time we add a description, for example, whether we do it inline or we go to our dedicated database documentation screen, this is not met metadata. So value type um, or whatever things I have defined here, these are actual column level DDL descriptions. And what's the benefit of that? The fact that A, it's all in one place, I can, I can query it. So for example, if I look for a format where I've left myself a comment earlier, I can find tables, columns, or even anywhere in the descriptions where someone has come in and left a helpful definition for me. So this, um, this attribute that I'm looking at, is in the following format. So as a developer, I might be able to tell because I know diagrams that it's a number, it's a primary key, but without this definition, without the business context, I don't necessarily understand how I can use it, what it represents, where it comes from, like in this case, our CRM system and things like that. And the benefit of having not just some proprietary format or storing this in XML or some abstraction, the fact that it's whole SQL underneath means A, it's easy to understand for just about anyone. B, I don't have to use separate tools. As soon as I take this DIM organization table, we can go to forward engineer and just save whatever I'm doing here. Let's do DIM organization so we see what that looks like behind the scenes. Um, I have that comment in, in SQL. So when I deploy that back to Snowflake, it's not just going to be constrained to my project. I use the project as a single point of for my design to, to centralize my, my development team. But once I deploy it, yeah, it's really it's a lot easier to use from database documentation, but anyone is going to be able to read this comment in Snowflake attached to the table. They don't have to go to an external tool or another governance tool to find that information. And the relationships are another part of that. So just like we see here, the constraint tells us exactly what is the primary key of, of, the, of the DIM organization table. So to answer that very first question I, that I get asked very often is, why do, we, why do we define these in Snowflake if Snowflake doesn't enforce them? Because they are an amazing guide for anyone that uses data and understands what constraints represent. So now I know that this is a conformed dimension that I can use across all my other tables and, and link them together. So because again, it's linked to the DDL, um, every other tool, is standardizing for that format. So if I start using, start building Tableau uh, reports in Tableau, for example, Tableau will automatically look for your primary keys to do join suggestion. If I use an ETL tool, uh, the ETL tool or ELT tool will again be able to draw me a schema based on these relationships as the tables are landed in my in my um, raw layer in my data warehouse. So the as long as you stick to SQL, you you can't go wrong, essentially. You're you're future proof. It's uh it's been around since since the 70s and it's not going away anytime soon. <laughs> and and another thing, Serge, that <clears throat> just want to bring up is when uh, when we are talking in those early stages in in helping people uh, prep for what the data architecture should be in the data models, there's a lot of um, you know, the, the executives in the room, the, they'll look at a data model. Oh my gosh, that's just too complex for me. I, I'm not going to understand that. But all you have to do is you open the data model up and you step through a question that they want to answer. All right. I want to be able to answer, you know, uh, you know, which, which partners of mine bought, um, you know, X amount of product and then just step through one by one, the, the model. And, and all of a sudden it's just like magic. They start seeing that the model itself is a representation of of the of the inventory of objects necessary to to generate answers to that question 
Um, and it changes the perspective completely. And this is why the visualization of this is so useful. <clears throat> yeah, well, Jared, when you, <clears throat> when you approach it that way, Jared, also, it helps people to understand that we really need to design this from the right, <clears throat> right, from yeah. the consumption side. Yep. Because like you're saying there, right, what are the questions that we need to answer? How do we need to organize our data and mm -hmm. turn it into this information so that we can answer the questions? Right. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's from the strategy side. And then if we turn to now the development cycle, the DevOps, the CI, CD, again, uh, we covered a little bit of um, some of the tools involved and some of the methodology, like using a repository, like doing code review, using unit testing and things like that, and automating them as much as possible. So this is where centralized tooling is really important. So. In this project, for example, before I even start, I just as important as setting the conceptual framework is starting to lay down the technical framework. So for example, this project, um, since I'm gonna be maintaining this code, evolving this code, centralizing the review and, and everything involved, I start, for example, by setting a naming convention. So let's say I want my all my database objects in, in uppercase or Pascal case or what have you. I can start setting my default naming. So maybe my for a specific project, I want all of my tables to start with uh, project initials, uh, PRJ or something, um, or things that are context aware, which I wouldn't have to normally name by hand, like uh, my primary keys can automatically inherit their respective table name and column names as part of their naming. And all of these with validate on project save, for example, I can have the tool automatically enforce. So actually I don't want this one. I'm gonna leave that as is. And this way, I don't have to police my developers. I don't have to be the DBA that goes chasing everyone saying, you, you know, you wrote uh, un, 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 untidy code or it doesn't conform to, to database conventions. The tool will automatically do that for me. If I, in Pascal case, let's say, and let's take subcategory and do lowercase column, make that an integer. Once I hit save, the tool is already reminding me, oh, by the way, uh, maybe you didn't know there was, we were following a naming convention, but we can go ahead and rename that for you and keep everything consistent and neat and tidy. Um, from there, the other thing that is very important is the change control. So if you use Git, you're gonna, you're gonna have that as soon as, assuming you're doing the, the commits and, and your, your check-ins, but even within the tool itself, we allow users to track exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. So for example, here, um, I have my agile sprint. Every change I make now is, is tagged with that sprint. I can see what I changed, um, what changed within that, what objects were created new, what objects were, were changed in general. So when I am ready to deploy that back to my environment, for example, here I've, um, I'm taking advantage of the tags feature in SQL DBM. So let's say star represents a, a deployment that I previously did. So now I, all these changes, I know this is what I wanna deploy um, fresh. So I know first of all, what changed and I can go ahead and forward engineer. So all of these changes, I know what I'm doing Forward engineer allows me to create not just the create SQL, the create DDL behind these tables, which is safe, but even the alters. So I don't have to keep track of every single change. And again, scrolling down to my last deployment, this is what I want to alter from. So what that gives me, whether it's generate SQL or generate alter SQL, is a neatly formatted. DDL that is going to be guaranteed to be error free. And there's no intervention, there's no fat fingering, there's no forgetting a, a comma or, or a parentheses. Everything is because the, you're guided through the graphical interface, 
the code that you generate behind the scenes is is guaranteed to be error proof. So again, because this is um, the tool allows both for exploratory kind of greenfield design. Maybe you start creating a table for which you don't have full requirements yet. You can absolutely uh, generate empty tables or columns without data types. This is why we have um, errors and warnings uh, both in on the diagrams, but especially relevant here on the forward engineer screen because to alert you basically that you have a column without a data type, you have an unused object, uh, you have duplicate column names, et cetera, something like that. So trying to minimize as much as possible, uh, even though the code is it's generated uh, automatically, but human error as much as, as possible. And from there, again, back to the topic, let me just jump back to my root directory of centralization and collaboration. So again, the thing I want to avoid is what they call multiple cooks in the kitchen. Everybody <laughs> access, accessing the database, making random changes, not talking to each other, not coordinating. So again, whether you use SQL DBM, whether you find some other mechanism to do this, another really important um, aspect of your data strategy is just making sure that everything is done through one central channel and people are coordinating, people are, in this case, we're working by sprint. We have multiple collaborators on this project. So even though right now I'm the one making changes, I can still, if I, if I get stuck, if I have a question, you can see these little icons, ask a colleague and say, um, you know, Debbie, can you help? She'll get an alert. She'll come in here. She'll she'll see what I'm what I'm what I need help with. She can navigate to the actual object and continue working. So I um I know I'm a little bit I'm kind of jumping around, but there's there's a lot to to say. This is a, a topic that we can go on and on about. There's there's no end, as we mentioned earlier. It's a continuous journey. It's an evolving journey. It's something that you need to plan. Don't you know you, as as Rich said, don't just take any random road to nowhere, like really understand where you're going. And that's going to guide the tools that and, and methodologies that are going to help you get there. So yeah, it, it's part of your data strategy blueprint, a very important part. Absolutely. OK, so we're coming up on time. I don't know if we want to take questions. Or... There's a, there was a question that came through. I don't know if you saw it, uh, Serge. It was during your, pre while you're presenting, it, it was a question. Uh, does SQL DBM have a way to store the data dictionary? Yeah. Uh, also allow imports of attributes from one when building a new data, uh, data model? Yeah. So yeah, great question. Yes, we do. So the data dictionary is what we were looking at uh, here. So I don't, I don't know if you mean, um, like data domain or just the actual DDL. So as I said earlier, we we allow you to edit this all on a single screen or you can do it from at column level and you can also export this to Excel. So here, for example, I have one from a recent demo, same exact structure. So not only does this give you a formatted um, object by tab output of your project. So it's like a little data uh, artifact for your for your project. But you can now edit this in Excel, which you know many users are more comfortable with, and import it right back to the tool with a single click. So only the yellow is editable, just like on the data dictionary screen. If someone messes around with your um, with your structure, the worst thing that'll happen is it just won't find a match when it tries to import that column. It just won't match what you already have created. So it'll only import the descriptions. Then I think we got some questions around sort of future features like, um, uh, you know, does it provide data lineage or a uh, dictionary uh, to, can you push it to, for example, elation? Sure. Um, but a lot of those are sort of future things that are on the horizon, right? Yeah, data lineage is, uh, we, we actually, we've got it, we're nearly there. It's gonna be amazing when we release it. It's, uh, as a developer, it's, it's something I'm very excited about because you can just take a script or a view as complicated as, as you can, can imagine 
and it will draw you all the all the data steps and the intermediate steps of of what that awesome. looks like. So <laughs> yeah, working, working diligently on that. Um, on elation, again, because this is what we tell people when, when they ask us, does it integrate with this? Does it integrate with that? <laughs> Say, does your tool understand SQL, then DDL? Then the answer is yes. So yeah. we don't necessarily provide a separate interface, but as long as you have that common data language, which every tool, elation or what have you, will understand, then yes, all of these will be transferable. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, I think we made it to the top of the hour here and, and, um, it was awesome presenting with you, Serge and Rich and Arcady. <clears throat> Been a pleasure. All right. We'll catch you all later. An excellent day, everyone. Take care. Okay. Thanks everyone. Take care.